welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, still protected by Dettol and also making us first India. We are delighted to introduce our next session, Cooking to Save Your Life, Abhijit Banerjee and Shreyan Olivier in conversation with Devapriya Roy. We all know of Abhijit Banerjee as a Nobel Prize winning economist. Now meet Abhijit Banerjee donning the cap of a gourmet chef. In his playful, erudite, and sensationally delicious cookbook, Cooking to Save Your Life, Banerjee takes us to the recipes he has delighted his friends, colleagues, and students with, from charred avocados to Andhra pork ribs to deconstructed salad niquas. In conversation with Shane Olivier, who illustrated the book, and best-selling author Deva Priya Roy, Banerjee speaks movingly of the bonds of food and memory, friendship and community, across cultures and continents. Abhijit Banerjee, as you all know, is the recipient of the 2019 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics. And he also teaches economics at MIT. He co-founded the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT and has authored six books, including Poor Economics, Good Economics for Hard Times, and perhaps his most fruitful, literally fruitful endeavor, Cooking to Save Your Life. Shane Olivier is an illustrator based in France. She builds her images from a visual vocabulary of elementary shapes like squares, circles, and triangles that form the basic blocks of a connected universe where humans, animals, plants, and minerals are all made of the same matter. Our moderator today, Devapriya Roy, is the author of three best-selling novels, The Vague Woman's Handbook, The Weight Loss Club, and Friends from College. Roy published Indira in 2018, a unique graphic biography of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in collaboration with Priya Kurian. And she's currently translating Tagore's Gora into English. Ladies and gentlemen, cooking to save your life. Abhijit Banerjee, Shri and Olivier in conversation with Deva Priya Rai. Over to you. Hello, welcome to this session where I must issue a warning. We are going to make you very, very hungry. We're going to talk a lot about food. And you know, I thought the timing was very opposite because between breakfast and lunch, Bengalis really like to talk about food. For example, you know, that's true, but I sort of, you know, to, to plan the rest of the day. Yeah, should we begin? Yeah. Okay. Before we talk about the book, this gorgeously illustrated, brilliant book, and I will tell you, I have tried out some of the recipes, so I'm going to have, you know, questions for the chef. But before that, I wanted to sort of start there, that food that we eat is also a lot about food that we remember having eaten uh, from childhood, youth. So I'd like both of you to share memories of a very, very memorable, dramatic meal. It could have gone terribly wrong, but... Should we begin there? Why not? Um, so for me, I think uh, it, the memory is always, uh, it's a, always a bit mixed because I, I, we never went to restaurants. So uh, once in about you know, six months, my father would announce, we're going to go to a restaurant. And at that point, you know, uh, and this was already two weeks ahead of time. And we started drooling from then. There was two weeks of drooling. Of uh, and then uh, I, I remember there was a Chinese restaurant in Kolkata called Eros, um, long gone, um, near uh, Society Cinema. And it was, uh, and I remember at the age of seven going there and they had um, roast squab. And it was extraordinary. I mean, I, I don't know whether it was extraordinary or not. US, I was seven. I never had Chinese food in my life. But it was a revelation. I must say that it, it was there in that moment that I realized that one day I'm going to write a cookbook. Not really, but, but, but right. almost. Right. Shane, what about you? Uh, my most recent memory of a terrible meal, one of the worst I've had, it was... Uh, when I arrived in China, uh, I arrived in a, in a sort of um, couch surfing where I met uh, two other uh, two other people, and they were both chef in um, what is this Spanish? 
in Ibiza, and they were doing a tour in uh, in China, and uh, we actually we ate so much because they were stopping in every street 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 snack food, and uh, and that doesn't go well with me. So we spend one week together eating mostly every single minute of the day. So when I left them, I felt so so sick that I just ate pomelos for one week, and then I. The only meal I had was uh, somehow put in a plastic bag and it was very badly, mildly cooked broccoli in a brown sauce. And, and that was awful. <laughs> so do you want to tell us how, um, Abhijit, do you want to tell us first how this book came to be? Oh, yeah. I mean, this book um, was sort of not meant to be a book. It was meant to be a, a present for my brother-in-law, Esther's brother. Why? He doesn't cook. He can't cook. He can cook. He likes to cook. He had been eating what I was cooking and he liked it. And so his, his, he was keen to get the recipes. And I thought, well, Christmas present, what do I do? I actually wrote a chapter and I decided that was his Christmas present. And, and I think what once you, and I, th I think the first thing you realize in trying to do that is it's extraordinarily boring writing recipes. Recipes are oh, God, not, yes. not interesting to write. So then I decided I had to be, do something to keep myself from falling asleep. And then I started to write text around the recipes and just find ways to amuse myself. So the goal right. was not to amuse anybody else, but me, I was... Uh, if I were to had to continue, it had to be that there was some game that I was playing. Right. I decided that there was a. I had to launch a game, and the, the book that, and then eventually I wrote more chapters for more Christmas presents for him, and then that was sort of the nucleus of the book. So, just to tell our uh, audience here, what he means is that every recipe is prefaced by a little situation, and it's it's funny, it's sassy, it's it's lovely. And it sort of uh, occurred to me that there is a, a novelist lurking somewhere inside the economist and cookbook writer. I, I think I think this is I think my best length is six lines. I think a novel won't work. I think I'm very good. I'm, I'm pretty a good novel at six, in six lines. Uh, yeah, I'm chapters. pretty good at six lines, but I don't think I will get very much further. I think th that takes more imagination than I have. Six lines I do well. So this this is there's lots of introductions, as she says. Some of them are ten lines, some of six lines, but they, they're good at six lines. Right. So while Shane tells us about how she came to be associated with this project, do you want to find one of your favorite little six line, ten line things? You're going to read it? Okay, I'll read it. Oh. So this is going to be related to what you uh, uh, was saying. What you were saying when I first read the book, I think it was on a plane when uh, when we were in India just after the the Nobel Prize, and um, and I read the book. And as an illustrator, what struck me was how you could somehow pair all the characters and scene of those little introductions, mm -hmm. and you could have a whole story. I, I could picture a set of characters interacting. And that's why somehow we, we chose to illustrate the book rather than using photographs because... Absolutely. I thought that was a great uh, a, a, a sort of a conceptual thing as well, mm -hmm. because we are sort of, uh, because of Instagram, because of all kinds of other media where people are constantly sharing food photos, there is, there is too much of food photography. And as we know that food photography for cookbooks is usually, it's not actually the cooked thing. It's styled heavily and it's half cooked for the best photographs. So you sidestep that all together with this brilliant concept. The idea was to drive people away from what it should look like in the end. You've also cooked together. Do you want yes. to tell us a bit about that? Well, Shen was our au pair. So she was, uh, she lived with us for three years with, uh, you know, picking up our children from school, um, you know, teaching them uh, how to draw and about life. And so, she, and, but one of her, I guess, mostly voluntary, but may not be entirely voluntary responsibilities was to help me cook. And, and I think for a while that was mostly mundane stuff. But then uh, I realized that she was actually interested in and actually good at it. So there was a transition through, you know, when she would, and she's, she's very modest. So she would say, uh, can I do this part of it? And I say, yes, you can do all of it. Uh, Shane, what about you? 
what is the kind of food you ate growing up and um, and how has that changed? Uh, one thing that I noticed is that my um, my dad actually went to India in the in the eighties by road. Ah, and right, there was a famous uh, land route. Yeah, exactly. Yes, via Take, Istanbul uh, uh, from Brussels to yes. to Delhi to Goa, and um, so actually we ate a kind of dal. <laughs> that a bit made me uh, think about it. We ate some sort of dal, and we would sometimes eat it with the hands. So that's something that I. Uh, Find, found back uh, living with Esther and Avicit. Uh, but mostly salads, actually, uh, the one uh, that is mentioned in the book. In the book, there is a secret chain salad. Exactly. And the one I cooked for Esther and Avicit when, last year when we were in Paris and we were, the three of us were co working. <laughs> so every, every lunch was yes, uh, yes. mostly a salad that salad. I would arrange quickly in 15 minutes. Of course. Um, it's a uh, it's in the book it's called shane salad but in fact it should be called shane salads because in fact it's it's a it's a model for a salad if you like meaning you can choose a, a green a fruit a nut a cheese and then you can combine them with a the dressing so it is everything is modular so in principle you could create as many types as you want so it's a it's a family of salads and so we, every day she would make one but it was never the same was all, every day was a different admixture of these ingredients. Um, so when I was reading the book, I marked out Cheyenne salad as the one I aspire to. But the, but the recipe that I cooked from the book before um, our conversation was like a good Bengali girl. I made mangsho jhol. And I followed the instructions to a tea. That's something I love about the book, that it's, it's very precise. Um, I struggled with some cookbooks in the past where, you know, in the, in the Indian tradition, we'll say that it's by Andaz, you know, the, the, the cooks, they're so, they're such experts. They, so initially it was very, uh, it, it's uh, the, the novice cook has to make a lot of mistakes to learn what the Andaz is. But this one actually will tell you teaspoon, tablespoon, but also by weight measure. So how did you actually, was, did you all run like a trial kitchen where... You perfected the recipes? A little bit. Uh, I think many of the recipes, I mean, first, I mean, this book is really things that we do cook. It's not things that we, right. um, you know, these are not aspirational. They're mm. meant to be doable, easy, things that we made many, many times. So it's not, I think Shane made many, many of them at a final trial without my help. So. So the, I, I think it's meant to be that. So and the quantities got adjusted along the way. So it's, it wasn't a, I mean, it, it was sort of a long-term project in that sense. Um, so should we take an audience question? We've got several. Uh, yes. Perhaps. Ah, that's, that's a writer, Balaji Vittal. Yes. Uh, my, name, my name is Shekhar. I'm a retired psychiatrist. Uh, with a plan to open a restaurant. It's going to be called Deep Freud. Uh, <laughs> my, Definitely my, coming the next time. My question to you, sir, is about the naming of dishes. And I'm sure Balaji would know that there's a dish in Kolkata called Kobiraji Cutlet. Yeah. I'm given to understand that the etymology of the word Kobiraji is coverage. Yeah. So I'd like to ask, so it's, it's about a coverage and it's been sort of uh, translated into Kobi Raji. So how do you name your dishes uh, in this book? And that's my question. It's an excellent question. I'm not imaginative about it. I, I you know, in retrospect, maybe I, I could have attributed, uh, more, I could have named them more imaginatively, but mostly they are very, they're pretty mundane dishes. I would not say that in within each culture, those dishes are actually standards. I, I think what the book does is, it provides uh, it kind of is meant to give you confidence to cook standards, not not to do something extraordinarily. I mean, there's some maybe twenty percent of the dishes are things that I invented in one form or another, and the rest are just standards. And so I, I wouldn't say that there's a lot there that's you know you don't want to call uh, you know spaghetti bolognese something else. It would only offend. Uh, so. In that sense, probably I didn't have much choice also. Right. 
Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, Abhijit. My question is: You said there were either the very low street food ones or the big restaurants. Now there were a few Bodhi's canteens and all those types in Kolkata. Uh, but maybe I get your point. Those are few, few and far between. Now and not that high end either. Not there that were high end. Kind of grimy. Yeah. Uh, I I thought you the premium you paid over the pure street food was for being able to sit under a, a noisy fan um, mm-hmm. rather than for the quality of the food. Uh, the quality of the food was. Roughly at the street stand, right? Is that the blank space that was taken up by the South Indian restaurants because they were able to afford those semi air condition, not fully air condition? They had two sections, and there was a plethora of those. Do you think that was the space that the Bengali food could not occupy that the South Indian restaurants walked in and occupied? That's probably right. That they was, but there was still at they were better quality, I would say, than the uh, I don't know. I, I, this is my prejudice. I like South Indian food, so I. But I, I think the South, even the South Indian food, I wouldn't call that high end. It was it was very basic, and you, you you know they were not encouraging you to spend time there. They would come and after about two minutes, uh, come and say that um, basically take your plate away before almost before you finish, so that you have a, to so you can move on. High uh, throughput model, as they say. Yeah, higher yeah, exactly. Uh, we'll take one more question, and then we'll of course come back to the audience again. Hello, sir. So, uh, as the discussion was uh, going on, uh, uh, ma'am, you noticed <coughs> you said that you know because of uh, people frequently eating out now, and because of the easiness uh, of home deliveries and takeaways. So, sir, do you think that is leading to uh, you know a lack or at least a lessening of creativity for people to cook themselves? So, personally, I'll be honest. I I hardly I can hardly cook. I learned like four or five basic dishes during the pandemic. But even then, I felt that you know. when i'm like at patience like there's really a lot of potential and variety that you can have especially in india where you have a host of flavors and uh, you know uh, other things to choose from so what do you think this is a good, oh, good think, question it's a nice question i i i think it's i i think the my, my, personally i would say that uh, that should would have should enhance your ambition in the sense it's it's precisely the fact that you don't have to do it every day that makes it even easier to to say that look you know today i'm going to do it I, in many ways i think at least for me it's an extremely uh, wonderful way to transition out of my work day so I, i literally come home i never sit down i start cooking the moment i come home and i cook for an hour and a half without uh, right after that and the reason i do it is because i do it every day essentially we all we keeping my parental tradition we never go out so um and the but i think it's great way to get you know i know whatever you do for a living you, this is a way to get your brain out of that and right. turn into something else i i really love the fact that it's you're doing something but it's using a very different part of the brain a very different part of your hands your hands are working in a way that you know as a professor my hands work but they work in a very specific and staccato way uh, and, uh, and this gives you just a different way of using your hands it, it, it's very very pleasant for me so i would say it's think of it as another way to unbend another way to use your leisure but it's also that then that's somehow what differentiates uh, just a, a, a mere assembly like a mechanical assembly of uh, raw ingredients into a, a meal i i feel that uh, the way you cook at, le- at least is uh, you pay a lot of attention to the heat to how it looks so you you really have to focus on it and somehow that's what makes it good in the end and that's that's what changes it's not a uh putting much more effort it's it's mostly paying attention so what i'm curious about is uh, you exactly. know that what is your kitchen vibe okay i'll tell you what mine is i the kitchen will look like a war zone and at some point i will have a meltdown and my husband will have to kind of mop me up okay <laughs> and then the food will emerge from the kitchen at least a few hours um past the time it was supposed to it's very very dramatic what's your cooking so i would do say the positive and let chen say the negative <laughs> uh, i i think i'm pretty good at time if i say a meal will be at 7:30 it'll be at 7:40 maybe but not i i'm not 
I'm good at time management. So if I calculate, it's going to take take a certain amount of time. It'll that that'll be it. Uh, and then there is the war zone part of it, which I can't talk about. Uh, which is often uh, one of the kids <laughs> coming and uh, saying at the very last moment, I, I think five minutes before eating, that she she has a big project. She wants to make a dessert for everyone, and she looks so adorable that you can't say no. And of course, she's going to do everything on her own, but you, you'll have to <laughs> pay attention, and you may put a foot in the in the big bowl full of rice and water and I don't know yes. other greens and stuff that the other kid <laughs> put and 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 guests arrive so you uh, also want to entertain them but then you might as well use them in the kitchen in the cooking process so it, it's very it's very like right um you know I think we should sneak in one serious question shouldn't we you know you're the uh, boss so, as an economist, you've, you, you've said uh, in the beginning of the book that, you know, economics comes from ukumania, yes, which is the management of household expenses. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have a terrible relationship with economics. <laughs> on that note. Um, so, how do you, you know, when you write about food, you're also um, a social scientist, you've traveled to some of the poorest homes, eaten with them. Some of those stories come across too. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I think that in a oblique way, this is a book of social science. I I I I, mean, I, I, I don't don't really disown my connection to social sciences. Indeed, it's a book of social science. It is. Uh, there's a. I mean, I I think. I eventually, uh, my original instinct was to say that, you know, this is going to become overly pompous and therefore I'm going to cut that all out. But in fact, both Chiki, who is our editor, and Cheyenne uh, said, no, you should put your social scientist back in there. And the book, it does have, and, uh, and I'm, I was persuaded, it was good advice. And I think what it does is it gives a book a layer that, we wouldn't have had otherwise, which is how to think about all the kind of the social challenges around Absolutely. food, and you know the the diversity challenges, the challenges of and the environment. All kinds of issues come up, and e right. so we have a section on each of them right. in the book. Uh, not hopefully not a tedious one, two pages, usually relatively right. lighthearted. But I think, so I do think that what the arguments we make there, and I, I say we advisedly, because a lot of the, those arose out of conversations with Shane. Um, hmm. I think that those, I do believe in what, what we say there. It's not right. just a gesture. Right, right. And it's very impactful, that little anecdote about the experiment in Switzerland on, on bankers. No, yeah, bankers, 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 and, bankers. bankers and humans. That was quite telling and, and clever. But uh, Shane, you're vegetarian. Um, we do have a significant section of meat and seafood in, in the book, um, because obviously, uh, as a... a as a good Bengali, you've written about it, that, you know, if you invite somebody, you'll say, come and have dal bhat with me. But obviously, it's not going to be dal bhat. There will be like three kinds of fish and uh, mutton and uh, five kinds of dessert. And even the guests will be super insulted if it's only dal bhat. They'll be <laughs> like, at least you should have made an omelette. I've heard this. <laughs> so... Um, do you want to just share that little experiment about the bankers and the humans and how there's a little nudge concealed there about how we can influence people who eat meat to think sustainably about it? Yeah, so I, I, the point of that experiment uh, is, was, I, it's a beautiful experiment. It's, uh, in, so what they did, and I'll, I'll say the experiment and then draw the, uh, draw the connection. So the experiment was they, they invited um, a bunch of bankers, all of them are bankers, um, Swiss bankers, you know, famously, uh, and they invited them in to do an experiment and they told them that the experiment is very simple. You go into a room, uh, you toss a coin, I don't remember, 50 times, something, and you report, nobody's watching you, there's no camera, you report what fraction of the coins were heads. 
and you get paid more if you have more heads. Okay? So you could imagine that that creates certain temptation to over-report heads. In fact, uh, and so what they, that was deliberate. It was not that this was, they had noticed that this was a, there was a temptation. The, the point of the experiment was that half of those bankers were told uh, to discuss their role as citizens. What do you do in the weekend? Do you help out? Do you do, do you know, other things that were kind of, they were prime, primed on their role as citizens. The other half were primed on their role as bankers. And if you look at the citizens, essentially, on average, tell the truth. They don't really lie, don't exaggerate. This is, remember, they're all bankers. It's not that they're it's bankers who were reminded they're citizens and bankers who were reminded they're bankers. When, when you remind them that they're bankers, they start to cheat. <laughs> Why do I bring this in? It's because it's, a, it's an experiment which shows that our sort of, I think the idea that we are somehow unable to deliver on, you know, change our preferences is just meaningless. We, don't, we aren't even one person. We are the person who is the banker, and we are the person who's the banker who's reminded he's a citizen, or she's a citizen. So there's and, this sort of social construct about food and so food that we need and to step our into. preferences, and yes, it's our our you know I I cannot endure this or that or the other. I am a Bengali, and I have to have my fish every day or whatever. All of these things are constructs, and I, I think that. The more we let ourselves believe that we are, these are essential, the, the more they get reinforced. I, I want us to examine what is Absolutely. really essential. Absolutely. And so, Shane, uh, you grew up, uh, I think I was watching in some other interview, you grew up in a very sort of carnivorous environment and you became vegetarian. So at, at what age did you make that choice? I, I actually didn't become vegetarian. I was raised vegetarian, so oh. I never... Uh, ate meat. I, I, I tried meat before, fish, etc. But the taste is so strong that I, I really, I, I can't eat it every day. But actually, meeting Esther and Avijit made me um, a bit more flexible on that because so since I grew up in, a, in an environment that could eat cold cuts basically at every meal, mm. uh, then I had to become a bit ideological to to make my point, to, to justify the fact that I was not eating um, meat or fish. And, and I also see some friends who from one day to the other, they decide they, they are going to become vegetarian and they're hyper strict about it. And a few weeks after, they are just... Uh, uh, yes, they, just they fall off to, the wagon. Exactly. So, so I'm... And Abhijit made me actually try many kinds of fishes and meat. So I can... Now I can eat it from time to time. But again, I... But mostly... I, I become uh, right. more uh, mixed. So I, I really think that there is a in between to reach, uh, and that actually and being too ideological about it can just have the opposite effect. Absolutely. So we'll take maybe one or two audience questions, and then let me tell you I have a rapid fire round. Okay. This is your time to prepare for the rapid fire round, both of you. Okay, Very easy right. questions. All right. Shall we take some one question from the back, please? I feel like we've maybe from a woman. Uh, I see. So far, yes, please. Only men. So, uh, hi, Abhijit. Hi. Devu Priya, uh, I can corroborate everything that Abhijit talked about being a poor graduate student in the United States because we were poor graduate students together, and uh, I had the. I had the pleasure of actually eating his cooking and he had the misfortune of eating mine because, you know, we used to cook quite a lot. So my question to you, Abhijit, I've, I have your book, I've read it. Um, you have so many cuisines from around the world. Which for you was the most uh, interesting, the one that made you think, you know, I, you grew up as an Indian, which, uh, which made you think about cooking? I think Italian. I think Italians, what they do brilliantly is you know, um, realize that if you pick the right vegetable at the right time, it doesn't take anything else to give a, to that plus some cheese and you can have a wonderful meal. I, I think that's an extraordinary, or even just a nut. I mean, I make pasta with just pistachio and it's 
It's wonderful. And you don't need anything else. It's just pistachio, little garlic, chili, and cheese. And it, it's wonderful. Uh, so it's, I think the Italian appreciation of the essential, you know, quality, high quality ingredients, which are in season, are extremely tasteful. Can, you know, they make pasta with just fresh tomato and basil and olive oil. You just chop it up, don't cook it. You put, cook the pasta, don't make a sauce, just dip the pasta, put the pasta in a bowl, cut the best tomatoes in season, which uh, you still have now in, in India, just the end, end of the season. Some basil, some ga garlic, chopped refined, some olive oil and some salt. And just let it sit for 20 minutes and you have a wonderful dish. And it, 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 that's the brilliance of Italian cooking. I think the idea that ingredients don't dominate, don't dominate it with other flavors. Don't need, you don't need meat, you don't need, uh, you don't need, um, you know, many spices. They do use spices and they use them very uh, sharp often. It's often quite spicy. Calabrese cooking, for example, is very spicy, but it's, it's not, it's never, uh, never dominated by, uh, you know, the spices. So it's, 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 it's a very, um, I, I learned a lot from the sort of the way they think about food. Right. But somehow, somehow it connects to another uh, idea that runs through the wood, which is the idea of pleasure that is uh, going to actually make us uh, eat in a more environmentally friendly uh, way. Because if you eat the right vegetable at the right time, then not only it's going to be uh, environmentally compatible, but it's also going to be extremely good. And this is not by by setting some very strict rule to yourself and to others that uh, you're going to bring more people uh, into changing their preferences. Exactly. So I, I think it's, it's exactly right that I think the, I think seasonality is such a, I mean, it's something that the, in the US, they basically try to make you forget by getting food from everywhere. But of course you don't forget it because when something's in season, right. it tastes better. Right, right. Uh, yes, this uh, the lady here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now, food and economics is related, connected. It's always there. It's so many layers. You don't even have to go abroad like we do, even in India from its borders across. Could you give us, as an economist, as a Nobel Prize economist, a cutting insight into the relationship of today's landscape of the availability of food, availability, and it's, in fact, it's too much of it sometimes, and to the economics. I mean, we all know traditionally, as you said, seasonal food was the thing. This is what our grandparents did. This is how we all grew up, and this is what we know about it. That's why I said there's so many layers I think, uh, Dev Priya, we could have a half a day of session on just uh, food, food and economics. It's not about cooking and recipes. It's much more than that. And I think there is a session on food yes. and so economics. So could you please? Uh, so uh, I think this, the book has a fair amount of this discussion, and I'm not going to be, uh, it's, it's too big a topic, as you say. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example that's uh, in the book, but I think is actually interesting. So if you, the U.S. has a a tradition of uh, eating, I would say, this is a slightly unfair, but not very unfair, of eating large, very large quantities of very bad quality meat. That's your, your median meal comes with a lot of meat and of no great quality. Both, I think, uh, slightly depressing, especially, you know, you get a lot, but you throw it away and it just doesn't taste good while you eat it. And I think it's a result of a particular sociological phenomenon, which is that the US was pre-populated by immigrants, poor immigrants from Europe. Poor immigrants in Europe lived on, didn't get meat. This was a culture where meat was too expensive. Uh, meat prices fall by 60% between uh, when the steamship is, uh, this, the air condition, air, the, the refrigerated steamship is introduced. Uh, so before that, meat prices are very expensive. Europe, poor people eat gristle, parts of bone and, right. and tendon. Right. And so when they found the meat, it was just so much celebration that the U.S. culture became centered around meat. And in particular, for example, parts of the U.S. like Texas, 
don't actually grow very much. It's a place where, you know, you, the only form of farming that was possible, and you see that a lot in the Westerns, is, uh, is the Texas Longhorn, which is a cow that can live on basically cactus. And, but the meat is not tender as a result. So you end, you end up getting this very low quality meat, but then plenty of it. And in fact, nothing else grows. So you eat a lot of meat. So I, I think the connection between the history and the geography, the history of immigrants coming from Europe with a history of not being able to eat meat, suddenly saying meat is very cheap. They're writing home uh, to their, uh, their families saying, look, I ate meat every day last week. Uh, and right. so this celebration and the geography, the fact that Texas really didn't go, that frames the what we can eat. And I think that's one of the one of the points that sort of we make in some detail. Right. Right. OK, We've, we don't have much time, so we have to do our rapid fire round very rapidly. <laughs> OK, so the same question for both of you. And you have to answer very quickly. Okay. You start with Chen, so Chen gets a chance to pick. <laughs> no, I'm going to start with you, so that Chen gets a little bit of time to prepare. Yes. Worst cooking disaster? I made a, 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 a mache jhol once. The first time I made it, I made it, made it with cod. And cod is, unlike, let's say, rui, is, is a very watery fish. So if you do what you do, would do with rui, which is pre-fry it and then put it in a sauce, it kind of crumbles into uh, uh, like breadcrumbs. It becomes like breadcrumbs. And it, 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 has, it was the most awful thing I've ever eaten, I think, in my life. Very good rule. Never make matcha jhol with God. Shien? Uh, me and my sister, we were trying to uh, do muffins for friends and eventually became into a sort of uh, lava that we gave to the to the dog but my sister eventually became a, a pastry chef at the ritz in paris so that's not uh -huh. she leveled up from there yes she really picked so herself up from that early <laughs> you can crisis. recover from disaster yes okay next question a meal that you cooked that got you a date ah uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can eat. I mean, you can I, I think uh, I think you got the order backwards. <laughs> I think you invite someone to a, a meal and you cook for them. Then mm. whether that gets you another date, I don't know. That's... You already managed to uh, get them come once, <laughs> so I think you're getting the causality mixed up. Uh, I actually made the uh, the recipe from the book. The fennel pasta works very well. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and the egg in a cube. Right? So I tried them all. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, favorite novel about food? Or favorite novel that talks about? I love novels that go on and on about food. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Or a favorite book about food? We can extend uh, it a bit. It's a, it's a, uh, yes, book. yes. Uh, then I go. Uh, and that actually uh, inspired the, this book. It's the, the Grammar of Spices by the designer Cas Hildebrand, um, in, uh, published in Thomson Hudson. That was very mm -hmm. much a, an inspiration. She paired uh, uh, information about spices with the work of Owen Jones, uh, an architect from the 19th century. Mm. Uh, it's oh, a beautiful nice. book. Poddanodir Maji. Uh, this, this is a Bangla novel by Manik Bandhubatai. Um, there's a scene where the, the, the fishermen are cooking, they're fished, they caught fish, and they're cooking it in, in the boat. boat. And, we, and she, he gives the entire recipe in there. It's simple. It has. I it, love novels which do that, which also, you know, yeah, yeah. Teach you. He, he yes. provides a recipe in it. It's, it's, even if you're not interested in the food part of it, it's a novel worth reading. It's extraordinarily good novel. It's translated now in, in English as well. It's really extraordinarily good novel. Um, okay. I'm letting you off really easy. Okay. There's only one last question now for both of you. Thank God. Uh, three economists you would invite for dinner. They could be from any time, you know. Uh, and what would you cook for them? And artists in your case, Shan. Um, who would I invite? Uh, I think Adam Smith. I think Adam Smith had a really good sense of life. John, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, so those are easy. The third one, uh, hard. Uh, because 
economists are not famous for their, uh, you know, sense of life, I would say. It's not, alas. <laughs> so, uh, so tell us what you'd cook for Adam Smith and what you'd cook for Keynes. Oh, no, no, I'll go cook one meal. I'm not about to. I, they're all coming for dinner it's together. <laughs> oh, okay. It's also going to be a very loud dinner then, and they'll all be disagreeing. So who's the third then? Uh, I, I, I just inv invite um, Kenneth Arrow, who's the 20th century economist I admire the most. So uh -huh. I'll, I'll invite Kenneth Arrow. I don't, I don't know whether he like. I don't know. I haven't met any of these people. Yeah. I met Ken, Ken many times, but not any yeah. other, not the other. But this just reminds me that Keynes was part of the Bloomsbury set, yes, right? Yes. And there is a Bloomsbury cookbook. Yes. So yeah, I yes. think he'd enjoy. He'd probably. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He was British from the 1930s. Uh, forgive me if I'm sound prejudiced, but I don't of know how, how. But what would I cook? Uh, I think I would cook since. Two of them are British. Uh, you know, there's some uh, recipe. The dessert is easy. Cheetah's trifle. I think cheetah's trifle is, um, I suspect they were all meat eaters. So I'll, I'll make the tagliata. It works extraordinarily well with meat eaters. Uh, and before that, I think I'm going to make uh, a soup. Um, the, I think the- The famine the, soup? Because they're sorry? too British? Uh, the famine soup, no, uh, and th that's for the that's for people nice that don't, don't like. Uh, um, uh, the the I think the tomato uh, and and potato soup will go very well with this. It's again, it's this is all imagining happening in the late summer when the tomatoes are good uh, and the potatoes are good. So the tomato with a uh, or walnut pesto, the uh, tomato and and, and potato soup with the walnut pesto. And uh, finally, the uh, so I have to finish quickly. And f finally, a pasta uh, to, to lead into it, a pasta with, um, a, a simple pasta with cauliflower and, and uh, nuts and raisins and a sort of Arabic inspired pasta from Sicily. Uh huh, that's a very fancy meal. Okay, I wish I were. You're invited. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Shane, what about you? Um, I think I really invite um, female artists who do geometric abstraction, like um, Ilma Afkins, Sophie Terbaab, or Barja Ratter. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I would pre-cut everything into geometrical shapes, and then we would assemble it together. Oh, <laughs> that would be a, a creative dinner participant. Right. Uh, unfortunately, I know we could have gone on for a long time. We are out of time. So um, I'm going to thank Abhijit and Shane for this absolutely wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Devakriya. You were wonderful. And if you're thank all you. very hungry, there are stalls that you can go straight to. <gasps> thank you. Thank you. In a way, if you do think about it, cooking is also a randomized controlled trial. We thank Abhijit Banerjee, Shane Olivier, and Deva Priya Roy for that ex exceedingly a discussion which made us hungry. And we thank One India for their support. There is no book signing by Abhijit, but Shane will be outside to answer any of your questions about the book, about illustration in general. So if you'd like to have a word with her, she's outside. Uh, Abhijit and Deva Priya do. Uh, Abhijit has a session right in Mughal 10. So if you want to catch him, please follow him there. And thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you at the next session.